Chapter 21 An Old Soldier's Honor Spirits of the Forest A Familiar Face The great plains that circle the city of Hyrule are a vast emptiness, where a man can ride for days without seeing another human being. In the south, they are a lush grassland, where the days are long and sunny and the grass ripples in the wind like a great green ocean. East and west of the city, the wilds give way to countless acres of farmland, thousands upon thousands of fields sown with corn or potatoes or barley, orchards of apples, oranges, peaches and meadows filled with quietly grazing cows and sheep and pigs. But to the north, the ground grows hard and cold. The soil is loose and shallow, and stones poke up through the sparse layer of yellowing grass. The northern edge of the plains, where the grasslands give way to the foothills of the great mountain range, is a cold place. A lonely place. Link's eyes burned with sweat, but he did not dare take the time to wipe the stinging droplets from his face. Vison pressed forward again, his feet tracing small intricate paths across the ground as he circled and darted forward and back, moving adroitly from side to side with a speed that was born more out of skill and practice than any physical strength. Their blades came together and apart again and again in a rapid flurry of flashing steel and the reflected light of the setting sun. As quick as Link could thrust the blade forward, Vison could step to the side and counter with a slice of his own. But that strike would hit nothing but air as Link spun aside and attacked anew. For an hour now they had been battling, and neither man bore a scratch. So supreme was their skill that the combat had been utterly flawless, like a talented pair dancers who would move inches from each other but never touch. They circled each other at the edges of the camp. You fight as well as I had dreamed you would, Link. Vison called to him. I could not ask for a worthier foe. Link said nothing, only keeping pace with the other man's footsteps as they turned around each other. It would be a noble death, an honorable one to die by your hand. Vison looked thoughtful. But honor and nobility, those are things for great men. And I am just an old soldier. First blood, then, Link shouted out. He did not want to kill Vison, if only for the tragedy it would be to slay such a talented swordsman. First blood, Vison echoed, and the battle was joined anew. Each of them sensed the other's fatigue, and knowing that the end was close they attacked with renewed vigor. The blades sang as they cut through the air, and Link fought back a wild urge to laugh. It was over in an instant. Vison's foot slid on the uneven ground, and Link parried his overhand slash. Sensing his opponent's unbalance, Link stepped forward, inside Vison's guard, and brought the master sword up into the older man's side. But Vison was too fast, and too experienced to be thrown off. He caught Link's blade with the haft of his own, throwing it aside and then thrusting forward once, a quick, precise motion. Vison's old sword parted the worn cloth of Link's traveling cloak and pierced his side just below the ribs. Link cried out and stumbled backwards, landing on his back. He dropped the master sword and clutched the wound with both hands, feeling the hot slickness of his own blood wetting his clothes. Vison dropped his sword. You're too fast, he said. I didn't mean to hurt you that badly. Still pressing down on the cut, Link rolled onto his knees. The sword had pierced deep and clean, opening his side neatly. He found that he could not move his body, even a slight twisting motion in his torso sent waves of fiery red agony through him. Navi! Vison shouted, Navi, come see what you can do. Link tugged off his cloak and pulled up the rough cloth of his shirt, wishing once more for his familiar chainmail and tunic. The wound was a deep red gash in his increasingly pale skin. Oh, no, Navi said, it looks like it's pretty bad. Thanks for the diagnosis, Link gritted his teeth. Hum. It looks like you've cut through the muscle. I don't know if I can heal it completely. The fairy buzzed back and forth around the cut, magic sparkling from her wings. Slowly, the bleeding stopped and the flesh began to knit. Link watched as the gash sealed itself, leaving an angry red line where it used to be. He took a deep breath and stood. F. I'm sorry, Link, Navi said, but that's the best I can do. It was a very serious wound. No, thank you, he said. His side still burned like fire, 
and any significant motion hurt terribly. Come on now, Link, Vison helped him stand up. Let's you and I sit by the fire and talk of battles past and yet to come. Two old swordsmen. Together, they hobbled tentatively to where the horses were tied, and Link sat against a rock as Vison went about building a small campfire. He had venison wrapped in wax paper in his saddlebag, as well as some crushed tea leaves and a kettle. Once Vison had the tea boiling and the meat cooking, he heaved a weary sigh and sat next to Link. Do you have any whiskey? Link asked him. For the tea? Vison made a disgusted face. I have a little bit, yes, but I certainly wasn't intending to ruin a nice hot drink with it. Well, put some in mine then. For the wound. You're crazy. It's been one very bad day. Yes, Vison nodded, stirring the fire with the tip of his sword. Yes, it has. They sat in companionable silence for a while, watching the flames. Navi floated in the smoky updrafts that rose from the heat, the magic of her shining and swirling with the smoke. I want to ask you something, Link. Vison sliced the roasted meat and passed Link his portion. With a look of reproach, he poured a dollop of liquor into a cup of tea and handed him that as well. A favor. A rather big one, I might add. When Link said nothing, he continued. I understand if you don't trust me. But if you do this thing for me, then I will swear to you my sword and my loyalty, for what an old tired man's word is worth. I would be a fool to accept any oath from you, Link said, without turning to look at him. You've broken oaths to both Ganondorf and to Zelda. Oaths sworn on foolish things, Vissen smiled. I swore to gods, to Zelda the princess, and to Ganondorf the king. I swore by justice, by honor, and even by my very life, but none of these were things I held in particularly high regard. But I am sure you believe me when I tell you that I will swear by the only two things I hold to be sacred. And what are those? My blade, he stuck the point of the old, worn sword into the hard-packed earth and bent to one knee. And my courage, as a swordsman. Link was oddly moved, for a moment. But then the tiredness returned to him, the weariness of a thousand lives. A piece of metal and another meaningless word. No more. I know that you know a sword means more to a man than that, Vissan sighed, and if you truly believe that courage is just a word, and not a measure of a man's worth, then I pity you. But fine. I knew you wouldn't believe me, not after what I did. But we were friends once, weren't we, Link? And our duel, was that not a worthy combat between two honorable foes? So allow me to present my request to you, at least. Link thought for a moment. Then nodded. Vissan smiled his sad smile again. I know you have met my apprentice, the Commandant Russell. I know you have fought with him, and I know that he considers you to be an honorable and worthy opponent. The two of you are very similar men. I think, that in another life, you could have been friends. Link took a bite of the roasted venison. It was still hot from the fire, scalding his throat on the way down. We were, he said. In another life... Tugging the blade out of the ground, Vissen resumed poking at the fire. I was a young man when I taught Russell, full of a young man's foolish ideas. Loyalty and honor and death before failure, that was what I pounded into the boy's head. And when that boy grew to be a man, those ideas grew with him. Those ideas are what got Colin killed, Link said coldly. A man murdered his own son because of some stupid sense of justice. Vissen hung his head in his hands. I know, Link. I know. But surely you know, as well, how an idea can possess a man. Consume him entirely, until it occupies his every thought, and action. Ideas are dangerous things. They give people an excuse to not think for themselves. True, true. Vissen removed the blade from the heart of the fire and held it in front of him. In the gathering darkness, the end of it glowed a dull red with the heat of the flames. For Russell, I think that the concept of honor was the fire that motivated him. He has done terrible things in Zelda's name, and his honor as a knight and a loyal servant is what kept him sane. What allowed him to sleep at night? But... But Colin, Link finished for him. The death of his son, by his own hand, was a cruel and meaningless thing. He could not rationalize it. And it changed him. He is a man consumed now, 
by guilt and the need for redemption. The princess intended for him to die atop the mountain, on my sword if need be. His task of hunting and killing you was a farce. The true mission, she gave to me. And what was that true mission? He gestured at the master's sword, which lay across Ling's lap. The delivery of the sword, and her offer of friendship. My duty is completed. This favor I ask of you, this is my request alone. Vison hesitated for a moment, before bowing his head and saying, Please kill Russell. Give my apprentice the noble death that he deserves. Link stared into the fire as it licked up the dry brush and the tough wood of the trees that grew sparsely out in the plains. Why are you asking me this? It is what he seeks. But he has too many scruples to take his own life. Russell's self-destructive course has already cost the lives of too many soldiers, both the night his son died and atop Snow Peak Mountain. Please, Link. Let him rest. And why can't you do it? You have already proven yourself a greater swordsman than I. Vison's knuckles widened as they gripped the stained haft of his sword. I could never, such a monstrous betrayal. The ways of honor and chivalry have their hold on this old swordsman, too. He is like a son to me. Then maybe you can glimpse his pain, Link said. Vison clung to his blade even tighter. No I don't think either of us will ever fully understand that. The sun had set fully now, and beyond the ring of light cast by the fire the world was a lonely darkness as night fell across the plains. When Link awoke the next morning, Vison was gone. His side still burned, but another burst of magic from Navi helped greatly and once he was up and moving about he felt a lot better. He took a few experimental swings with the master's sword. The wound was placed halfway up his abdomen, so that it hurt fiercely to twist his body or lift his arm too far above his head. He didn't like being unable to use his sword. He felt vulnerable. When he mounted Epona and tried a slow trot, however, he realized that he was still perfectly capable of riding, although he'd probably need to take a break every couple hours. He could tell from her restlessness that Epona was dying to run, so he let her. Come on, girl. Ha! Huh. She broke into a gallop, streaking across the lonely grassland, the morning sun warm on Link's face and the wind cool in his hair. He rode aimlessly for a time, relishing the feeling of speeding across the landscape, before turning south towards the forest. It wasn't a long ride, and the sun was still rising in the sky when he rode past the stunted, scattered trees that marked the edge of the forest. He made a brief stop in the shade to recuperate from the strain of the ride and his injury as well as eat some of the leftover meat from the night before end, and then continued his journey into the wood. Navi, when we passed through here on the way north you mentioned that the Great Fairy's Fountain was in this forest. That's right. The fairy was sitting between Epona's ears, looking back at him. Ganondorf mentioned that the Great Fairy will grant a boon to travelers who seek her. Millimeter HM only one, though, so you need to be careful what it is. There were many favors he needed done. How could he pick just one? Take me to her. A familiar voice echoed out of the treetops. That won't be necessary. Link tugged on the reins gently, and Epona slowed to a stop. Laughter bubbled out of the greenery, childish and cheerful. Link couldn't see Saria, but he knew she was there. Come on out. Why don't you? I think Epona missed you. The forest girl dropped out of the trees and skipped over to pat the horse. The Deku tree knew you would come back. I did too. You are kindred to the forest spirits. You seem much more cheerful this time, Link extended a hand and helped Saria up onto the horse, where she sat in front of him. She was tiny, and even lighter than she looked, even with his wound it was easy to lift her up with one hand. That's because the other ones aren't with you. Midna? And Ganondorf? Yes. The Deku tree senses darkness in their hearts. They are no friends of ours. It made Link sad to realize that perhaps they were no longer friends of his, either. His perception of Ganondorf was forever tainted, but Midna had done no evil, and he still felt guilty for abandoning her atop the collapsing mountain. So can you guide us back to Hyrule? Sari looked up over her shoulder at him. 
You are in no hurry. It wasn't a question. You will speak with the great Deku tree first. More gods. It seemed that he was not done with them yet. How far away is the Deku tree? His grove is in the center of the forest, many leagues from here. But the journey will not be long. An intruder could trek through these lost woods for years and never see another soul. A friend of the forest will find the path open before him, the fruit plentiful on the trees, and his journey quick. This is a magical place. I'm sure glad we're friends of the forest. Navi bubbled. Saria smiled at the fairy. You two belong here. You are just and you are kind. Your spirits are at home in the forest. You can tell. She shook her head. Not me. The Deku tree can see the true nature of all who set foot in this forest. Link couldn't stop himself from asking. And what of Ganondorf and Midna? Where do their spirits belong? Saria closed her eyes. Link didn't know if she was communing with the god of the forest, or simply gathering her thoughts. The ancient king Ganondorf is born into death and desolation. His soul is the heat of the sun, the drought of the desert, the desperation and fear of the endless sands. This is one who seeks power, at all costs, and finds it, because without strength he is helpless. And Midna. Saria closed her eyes again. She was silent for much longer, this time. A spirit at a crossroads, with no home. Fire, and shadow. Impotence, and rage. That is what the great tree sees. As they rode deeper into the forest, the trees began to get older and taller, until they were passing ancient trunks as wide as houses. The forest canopy was high above them, through a thick network of branches, and the forest beneath was cast in a greenish gloom. A man agile enough could travel for miles through the trees, climbing from branch to branch, and never touch the ground. He began to see strange lights flickering through the darkness of the wood, sometimes far away, sometimes just behind him. Whether they were more kokiri, or fairies, or some kind of magical guardians, he didn't know. Saria noticed him watching the lights. Those are the spirits of people who are lost in the forest. They wander now, forever, looking for a way out. But they will never find it, the path only reveals itself to friends. A chill ran down his spine. They're so pretty! Navi exclaimed. Soon he was hearing things too. The noises were hushed, but they were there, and nothing escaped his warrior's senses. The sound of leaves rustling where there was no wind. The creak of branches as weight was lifted off of them. And, even more faint, children's laughter. It has been a very long time since an outsider was brought so close to the heart of the forest, Saria said. Her voice rang out clear in the silence. The Deku tree's children are curious. Although the sun's light did not penetrate this far beneath the leaves, they had been riding for hours, and Link could tell that it was now night time. The darkness seemed to grow more acute, and when a faint breeze did blow through the hush of the wood, it carried a chill with it. Still, this blackness was comforting somehow. It was natural, organic. Nothing like the malevolent dark below Hyrule City. That was an unnatural place, devoid of light, and warmth. Just ahead, Saria pointed up to the top of the ridge ahead. Over that hill. Link spurred Epona forward, and suddenly the forest fell away and the night sky was all around them, inky blue and bright with stars. They were at the top of an enormous basin, wide open and lush with grass. The edge of the wood stretched behind them, curving around along the vast upper edge of the depression. The meadow was quiet and peaceful, alive with the lights of countless fairies and forest sprites. At the very center of the basin was the largest tree Link had ever seen. The great Deku tree was an ancient specimen, as wide as any tower built by the hands of man, and nearly a mile high. Its bark was stone-like, twisted and gnarled, and Link could almost believe that there was a withered face wrought into the side of the tree. He noticed that all around them, kokiri were emerging from the forest, streaming out of the trees and sitting cross-legged in the grass. He saw more denizens of the wood, fairies, and Deku scrubs, and brutish moblins, and some strange wooden creatures with masks made out of leaves. A hushed voice spoke, carried to him on the wind. Approach! Link looked down at Saria. She nodded. 
the tree is father to all spirits of the forest. Even you. Link slid off of Ipona's back and slowly approached the Deku tree. The forest creatures parted silently, clearing a path for him. He stepped forward and gently laid a hand on the gnarled surface of the tree, and then sat down before the god. The grass was damp and cool. My son! The tree whispered. Courage! You have returned to your home. The forest will always be where you belong. He remembered calling the forest home, many forests, in many childhoods, in many versions of Hyrule. Childhoods that always ended too soon, when he grew into a man and faced his destiny. The forest will always hold a special place in my heart. But I cannot call it home, much as it pains me. There was a silence filled by the rushing of the wind through the Deku tree's leaves. On that rustling, his voice carried, You can escape this fate of yours. This burden you take upon you is greater than any you have ever known, oh hero. Do you still wish to take it? Do I have a choice? Link scowled. You have always had a choice, oh hero. In more ways than you could possibly know. He shook his head and drew the master sword from its sheath, the blade positively glowing in the moonlight. You're wrong. For as long as I've carried this sword, and as long as innocent people suffer, there has been never been choice. Not really. And yet, you flee from the city, and come to me, so very far away. I'm going back. I have to. You are blessed with true courage, my child. It was my role to offer you this choice, such as it was. But your answer was never in doubt. So the Deku tree was just another part of the charade that was his life. He didn't know what the creators expected of him, but he couldn't leave the people of Hyrule to suffer, no matter what. If I may, great Deku tree, may I request a favor from you? Speak, hero. As your child Saria has told me, this forest is a magical place, bound to your will. I ask you to speed my progress, that I may return to Hyrule as quickly as possible. I know that this is within your power. It is done. When you leave here on the morrow, the forest will help you, guide you on your way. You will always be a child of the forest, Link. Thank you. I am in your debt. This time the rustling of the leaves sounded like a kindly chuckle, the sound of a father's amused laughter. Well, what did he say? Navi asked him when he returned to the spot at the top of the ridge where he left Epona. We ride for Hyrule tomorrow, Link said, lifting the saddle off of the horse's back and fishing through his pack for a carrot or an apple to give to Epona. He dared not light a fire in this sacred grove, but the night was warm and humid, and the grass was cool and soft. When he lay down to sleep, the forest girl Saria disappeared back into the trees, but he knew that she was nearby, watching over him. This is the path to Hyrule Field, she pointed at the trail through the woods. A brave adventurer like you can probably find his way to the city from there. Do you have to go? Navi asked. Saria looked back towards the tangle of branches. This is the very edge of the Deku Tree's enchantment. I am sorry. I cannot travel with you any further. Link, who had been leading Epona along on foot, knelt down to lay a hand on the forest girl's shoulder. Thank you, Saria. You've been such a great help to us. Saria lunged forward to hug him. Her arms did not fit all the way around him, and she buried her face in his chest. Never forget your home, Link. And she disappeared into the forest. They had been riding through the woods since dawn, and now the shadows of the trees were beginning to grow long and dark as the sun descended further towards the horizon. He would have to make camp soon, although he was certain he would be able to make it to the city by noon tomorrow. Hey, Navi said, I know this sounds weird, but did Saria seem kind of familiar to you? Trust me, Navi, I know exactly what you mean. As he made his way down the beaten path through the forest, he realized with a strange sort of chill that he had been here before. 
and not in any sort of existential sense, this was the same forest path he had traveled on that rainy night when he had first come to Hyrule City, seemingly an eternity ago. And if this was that very same path, then just ahead would be the spot where... Surely enough, flickering through the trees, was the light of a campfire. As he approached the campsite, he knew what he would see, a solitary figure hunched over, with the weight of an enormous pack on his back. As Link approached, the figure made no move to acknowledge him until he was standing almost within arm's reach. Do you remember, Hero, that rainy night when we first met? What's your role in this? Link asked the happy mask salesman. What part do the goddesses have written down for you? The man smiled his familiar unsettling smile. Why, it would be extremely poor showmanship if I spoiled the ending before its time, oh hero. No more questions, Ling said. Answers, now. No more questions, the salesman said. There was a rabbit roasting over the fire, just as there had been that first night. You are a god, aren't you? Link settled himself down by the campfire. All the other gods push the three of us further along our path, but they aren't anything more than puppets, not really. What makes you different? Not much, hero, not much. The mask salesman whistled a few bars of some long-ago tune. It sometimes doesn't take much to change a destiny, to tip fate in one direction or the other. Suppose a strange messenger appears before some princess high in her tower? Suppose a dirty traveler on the road crosses paths with a fallen king, and happens to mention a distant mountain where miracles happen. The firelight glinted oddly off of his eyes. Suppose a wandering salesman meets a hero, deep in the woods, and points him in the direction of a city where his help may be needed? Suppose all those things happen. What then? So you're just like the rest of them, Link spat. A puppet. Well, I have no intention of dancing on strings for anybody be it man or goddess. The salesman laughed gently. The most talented of performers, oh hero, play their part but make the show their own. Do you think that the goddesses intended for you to question their will so deeply? Do you think they intended for you to know just how much of your life, of your lives, has been orchestrated? He remembered. On that rainy night, the mask salesman had given him something, a purple, heart-shaped wooden mask, a forgotten relic. It had seemed useless, but he had hung on to it, just like the rest of his souvenirs. And in doing so, sowed the first seeds of his dissension, the knowledge of his past and future lives. You've... been helping me? Link asked. The man laughed again. I've asked you many questions, hero. Difficult questions. You may not have used words, but you've given me answers nonetheless, though there are some answers yet to come. Why should I believe you? Why should you trust Vissen? Or Ganondorf? Or Midna? I'm afraid I can't offer you a compelling reason, but perhaps some evidence will help. Do you still have the relic that I gave you when we last met? He did. Link dug around in his saddlebag and withdrew the golden compass from the night on Cremia's farm. The metal had a faint warmth in his hands, and seemed to glow slightly. This doesn't point north. The salesman smiled. It's pointing to... Hyrule City. It is indeed, although it would be more accurate to say that the compass is pointing to something inside Hyrule City. Hold on to it, hero, for there are deep places there where no light shines, and you just might be thankful for something to guide you in the darkness. He looked down at the compass, turned it back and forth and watched as the needle always pointed firmly in the direction of Hyrule. Something inside the city? But what? Link looked up, and the happy mask salesman was gone. He sighed. Of course. At least that he had left the rabbit, still roasting on the fire. Link helped himself. It was no special talent, to glimpse a person's soul. Oh, certainly, it took an exceptionally gifted seer to peer deep inside a man's heart and fathom all of the good and evil there, all of the deepest desires and fears, and not go mad. But anybody with even a drop of magic in their blood could skim the surface of that well, and see just a little bit of that man's true nature. 
Vati was lying atop the battlements overlooking the east gates, staring down at the sea of life below as traffic streamed in and out of the city across the many bridges that spanned the river. He lazily swept his magic over them, scanning for any trace of power. He and Zant had spent the past few days performing this monotonous task, Zant atop the north wall and Vati atop the east. According to Zelda, those were the only directions of the compass that needed watching. If pretty boy Link had an ounce of brains in him, he would circle the city and use any one of the many bridges on the western side of the river. He could be hopping back and forth the Hylia five times a day and they would never know. The wind mage waved down one of the guards patrolling the top of the wall. You there, I haven't eaten anything all day. Where's your captain? He's, um... Eating lunch right now, Lord Vati. Good. Bring me what he's eating. As the fool in the tin suit rattled off, he turned his gaze back towards the crowds. A man selling furs was having his entire inventory confiscated and causing quite a ruckus. You would think he'd have learned by now to be quiet about it, lest he wind up in the river. Another boring day. The kid must have died up north, because there sure as hell wasn't anybody down there with power to rival a god. Either that or he wised up and took off, cause he'd have to be an idiot to show up in Hyrule again. He sat up. I don't believe it, he whispered to himself. But there it was. A trace of magic. No, more than a trace, a surge of power, almost exactly like the magic within Zelda herself. Desperately, he began to rake his eyes across the crowded bridges beneath him. There were literally thousands of people down there, true, but only one of them could possibly have that much power inside him. There. Hidden beneath a beaten and stained old traveling cloak, riding next to some farmer woman towing a wagon filled with jugs of Chateau Romani. Blue eyes peered out from beneath the hood, and just above them a brief flash of blonde hair. The sword on his back was finely made, far too fine for any farmhand. He couldn't believe his luck. I almost feel sorry for you, friend, Vadi chuckled. You have to be a special kind of stupid to come back here. As the man on horseback rode into the stone tunnel through the city wall, Vadi turned and, buoyed by the wind, leapt from the battlements and landed on the rooftops below. The tiny mage streaked across the city, up towards the lofty spires of the castle, to deliver his message. Link, the bearer of courage, had returned to Hyrule. Chapter End